Morning's docket, case number 108859, Drewer Nordis v. Rosenquist. Your Honor, I'd like to reserve five minutes. Five minutes is granted. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the uh, practical realities of medical malpractice litigation. And I don't think these are matters that the court is unmindful of having reviewed lots of uh, records on appeals of such cases. And it's difficult, to say the least, for a plaintiff in a medical malpractice case to um, carry the burden of proof. And it, the difficulties result from medicine and from medical doctors. And to, they're, there really is a conspiracy of silence. The problem is it only runs one way. It runs against the plaintiffs. When it comes to um, giving testimony on behalf of a health care provider, they will readily volunteer. And with great chivalry, they will readily volunteer. They will fall on the sword if it will help their fellow health care provider escape um, the litigation. And it, the, this case is hugely important because if we were to allow a subsequent treating physician to come in and say, I wouldn't have done anything differently had, um, had the earlier doctor, nurse, or whoever followed the standard of care, they'll be coming in in every case to say that. And they will, they can potentially, they would knock out every case. Well, counsel, the, my understanding is that's, that's not why your client lost at the lower court. It wasn't because the defendants provided testimony that they wouldn't have done anything different. It was because you failed to provide any evidence that something different would have happened. Your Honor, I think there are two. Two issues. I mean, that earlier question, I think, is clearly, the, it's in his report, it's in the deposition. There's no escaping it unless one is to... You're talking about Dr. Glick's report? Right. And in his deposition testimony. The only way to escape that is to engage in picking and choosing or some kind of semantical arguments as to what he said. All that stuff goes to weight and credit. But I think if you read um, Dr. I'm sorry, if you read Judge Vining's opinion, you can see that there's a hint at what he's talking about, something other than that, which is what I guess they would call um, factual causation, or I'm not quite sure what the legal terminology they use for it, but he was saying it didn't matter what Glick said. He, 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 I agree with you that he did say the latter, too, that wasn't in his report, wasn't in his uh, deposition. And I think I, that's clear. I, set forth that in the written brief, but he also appeared to be saying, and they argued that um, as a matter of law, that it didn't matter what Dr. Glick said because um, Dr. Beamer said he wouldn't have done anything differently. So what he's saying is that the, the case depends on what a subsequent treating physician says okay. and not upon the standard of care. Isn't it really different because what the treating physicians are saying is that they never saw Dr. Rosenquist, if I'm pronouncing that right, and never saw his written report and never heard anything about his read of those CT scans, period. They, in trying to remember exactly what the testimony was on that point, um, there, it came from the physician's assistant that the physician's assistant had a conversation with Dr. Rosenquist on the phone. And during that conversation, um, the physician's assistant related to um, Dr. <coughs> Beamer what Dr. Rosenquist had told him. So there was a communication, and there naturally should have been a communication, as to what the CT results, I mean, that's what we have radiologists for, to provide, they either provide it orally or they provided in a written report. In this case, it was provided orally. It was relayed by the physician assistant to Dr. Beamer on the telephone. And Dr. Beamer said, he recollected the conversation, but he said he wouldn't have done anything differently. But isn't that reality? 
I mean, even if they had received the report from and, and knew what the first read had been, the surgeons are not going to go in and, and begin a surgical procedure without having looked at it themselves or had a full report in hand at least. Right. They wouldn't, I mean, have, I, they wouldn't have done it on a phone call by a physician's assistant. Well, sometimes, sometimes the communication of um, the uh, film is done on the phone because it takes a while to generate the written report. Sure, so, but I doubt that would have been through a physician's assistant. I mean, in reality, if it, if they had, if anything, they would have called the radiologist and got an, a direct report. Um, so, doesn't that break the causation link? Well, the I'm not sure how much of this is in the record, but the testimony was that uh, from the physician assistant that that's the way it was done in this case. That it was because it was, the uh, film was done teleradiology. And so it was gonna be a while before the actual report was generated and the Dr. Beamer and the surgical team, not, I don't, I think it may have been the next day. I don't remember exactly when, but it, it wasn't, it may not even, the report wasn't even done you know, well, what I'm suggesting is that this conspiracy of silence, which may exist, really do doesn't impact as a practical matter in this case because the reality is that the physicians at Via Christi would have undertaken their own examination of the CT scan to d before they would have. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure the fact that they might have testified that they wouldn't have done anything different would have been any different even if they had had a. I think Dr. Glick in his report and in his deposition testimony um, stated that they needed to communicate the radiologist or the PA or if he wants to relay it, relay it through ever, needs to communicate uh, the film there to the a, surgeon. There was a breach. I mean, I'm sorry? You, you've established that there was a deviation from the standard of care. Right. But he needs to, and the, part of that is that you, gotta, you don't just read the film. And you know you got to somehow communicate, you know what you see on it, whether it be orally or by written report. You communicate that to the subsequent treating physicians. Had that been done in this case, according to Dr. Glick, that that would have resulted in earlier, more closer monitoring, earlier life-saving intervention. So how, I mean, I, and how I, can I, that be when the radiologist <clears throat> at Via Christi? would have told the surgeon what they saw. That, that's weight and credit, though. I, Your Honor, I believe that's weight and credit. That, you know, they can have, that's, now we're right to that issue that I was... Is that uh, weight and credit or is that intervening cause? Um, is it, which, I'm sorry, intervening or what? I, intervening cause. Uh, I don't know um, how to characterize it. And there's an interesting blog from a, a Harvard professor named Alex Stein that... I had read this morning that he talks about this issue. And as law professors tend to do, they complicate things with some terminology. But Counsel, are you about to read to us what some unknown physician put okay. on a blog this morning? Was no, that your intention? I, I was talking about what a Harvard professor had said about. Okay, sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> um, but it, there's some people that use terminology evidentiary damage. I don't doctrine, you know, rather than talk about uh, intervening cause or whatever. But, you know, I mean, I don't think there's, I don't think the chain of causation can be, if we allow the chain of causation to be broke by a subsequent treating physician, would be it a radiologist, another radiologist at Via Christi, or um, the uh, surgeon, Dr. Beamer, to come in, I mean, I think we're opening the door to allow them to break that chain of causation. Medicine is delivered and links. Counsel, and, if I could sure. zero in on this, I, if I grant your argument, for the sake of argument, that you can stretch Dr. Glick's testimony and his report to the point that you want to stretch it to, which is, but for his breach of the standard of care, there would have been, this would have taken on a more emergent nature, and he may have, uh, the patient may have gotten these tests and treatments sooner. Is there anything, however, in Glick's testimony at all that says, had that happened, the harm would have been prevented. In yeah. other words, the, the, the plaintiff would, would not have died. 
Yes. I mean, he where could. is that? Can you point me to that? Sure. Glitch doesn't say that. I, at least I don't see him saying that. It's in. I put it in. It's in my brief. But let me find it here. And I, I can go back and check as well if you, if you can't point me so to it. In his report, he says, had that been done, appropriate and life-saving intervention should have been administered. That's in his written report. That's not the same thing as saying that the harm would have been prevented, though. Is it? I, I think it is. Okay. Isn't that what we're down to, deciding whether that phrase is enough to get you past this motion for summary judgment, because regardless of anything else, our universe is confined by the motion for summary judgment and by your responses. And it seems to me that there's, there were two paths to get to the radiologist. One was that he did something wrong and the doctors at Via Christi relied on that and that caused uh, the victim's death, that's been foreclosed on you. You didn't controvert the fact that these doctors at Via Christi uh, did not rely on anything that Dr. Rosenquist did. I mean, you, I mean, all I can do is look at that and there's, you, know, you didn't controvert. So that path's closed. So now the only path left to you is that Rosenquist would have should have done something different and that would have alerted Via Christi to do something. And the only place we can look to connect those dots is Dr. Glick's report and his deposition testimony that you recite in your response, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So we're really down to whether should have done something different is, the, is a sufficient causation link to get you past summary judgment when viewed in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. Correct. There's no other place to look, I guess, is what I'm making certain that we need to do. Well, I think, I think we, you can avoid that whole other argument, which they were raising about um, causation in fact, about how somebody can come in and and testify that, regardless, and let's assume that there's no question about the wording of Dr. Glick's opinions. Well, there is no question, because all we have to do is look at it, and those right, are the words. Right, but they, they're saying that, and I believe Judge Vining was also saying that it doesn't matter what Dr. Glick says, because these subsequent treating physicians came in and said they wouldn't have acted any differently. And that's in the other aspect of the case, and um, I, I think the, the, I just don't, yeah, I've already made that point already. I'll uh, reserve my five minutes. Do we have any further questions? Thank you, Council. Good morning, may it please the court, Shannon Holmberg of Gilliland and Hayes on behalf of Dr. Rosenquist. And I would first like to start off with saying that I don't agree with um, plaintiff's counsel's characterization. I don't think that what Dr. Beamer said about what he would have done with a different read really has much to do with why we're here today. I think the court has correctly identified why we're here today, and it's whether or not plaintiff has produced sufficient expert testimony to pass a summary judgment motion. And quite simply, he has not. The four elements necessary to prove a medical malpractice action are not new. Um, they're well known. You must prove breach, duty, injury, and that most, maybe not most important, but that very important causal connection link. And we're not talking about identifying the cause of death, which arguably Dr. Glick has done in his report and in his deposition. That's not the same thing as saying that had Dr. Rosenquist complied with the standard of care, in their words, had he identified what was going on on this CT per what Dr. Glick saw, that then that would have spurred some kind of action that would have made a difference for Mr. Druard. There's just simply nothing in Dr. Glick's testimony or in his report that says 
that identifies what would have been done. First of all, he identifies some scans and some further testing that, in his opinion, would have been done uh, had the correct, um, the correct read been performed. But there's nothing that goes on to say what the life-saving intervention would have been. In fact, when further pressed in his deposition, he was given the, the opportunity to explain these opinions in his deposition. He said, I can't speak to that. I'm not a surgeon. That's a surgeon's call. I don't know what would have been done um, if further testing but, had been done. But the point he was making is something needed to be done other than just doing additional testing. Wasn't that his point? Is that if he had read this correctly, uh, would have raised the red flag that, hey, this, this uh, patient needs something done. He doesn't need additional testing, needs something done. That was Dr. Glick's point, is that it would have raised a red flag, could have said, alerted someone to say something else should have been done. But again, that doesn't speak to, does that change the outcome for this patient? There's simply an, an absence of evidence in this case to say what would have been done or what should have been done. In, in other if words, you're saying we it. don't know whether the patient was already irreversibly terminal when he got in the ambulance to go to St. Francis? Yes, Your Honor. I think that, that element has to be proven by medical expert testimony, and they have not done that in this case. Is this a loss of chance case? No, Your Honor. That so it's been... something short of that. Um, I think that, that Dr. Glick also indicated that there were alternative tests that would have been less stressful and less likely to have caused um, some of the medical issues that arose, is that? I'm not aware that he said they would have been less likely to cause the medical issues that arose. I don't think that's in his opinion. His opinion was that these tests could have been done when um, the patient was more stable. Okay. But again, he doesn't say um, whether or how that would have impacted the ultimate outcome in this case. And that's what we need to do is have a link that says, but for Dr. Rosenquist's alleged negligence, this outcome wouldn't have happened. And that's completely absent from Dr. Glick's testimony. And it's in our brief, but I think it's worth noting as well, Dr. Glick, uh, in, in answering some questions at his deposition, said, I'm not here to talk about causation or outcomes. And those were his words. That, those weren't words that were proposed to him um, by the attorney asking the questions. He said, I'm not here to speak about outcomes. I'm here to speak about what was required of the radiologist, how he could meet the standard of care. That's what I'm here to talk about. And even later, I think it's in the brief that, as well. Well, that's in the Court of Appeals opinion. That testimony you just uh, quoted is in the Court of Appeals opinion. Yes, and it's in the briefing as well, Your Honor. And, and eventually he was also testifying about and asked whether he could speak to confirming that he was not speaking to causation. He said, well, I can speak to causation only as it relates to what I saw on the film. And I can say what was on the film was what eventually caused um, his death. Again, that's not tantamount to saying that there was something that could, that could have been done to help to change that outcome had that been called to anyone's attention. There's simply an absence of expert testimony um, anywhere in the record, and I don't think you can spin Dr. Glick's report or his testimony in any way to read in that causal link. He expressly said he wasn't doing it. He was given numerous opportunities um, to clarify and there's nothing in there saying, obviously, he said he didn't know what would have been done. He said, that's a surgical decision. I can't speak to what, what would have been done, whether it be surgery or anything else that's up to a surgeon. So if he can't speak to what would have been done, there's no way he can have an opinion as to if things would have been done, would, would they have changed the outcome in this patient? There's just no way to make that leap because he doesn't know what would have been done. He doesn't know how that could have been, how or if it could have changed the outcome. And without expert testimony to prove that vital causal link, the claim has to fail as a matter of law. If we just focus on his written report right now, <clears throat> and the sentence in his written report is, quote, more likely than not, 
this would have resulted in a stat ultrasound and or HIDA scan when Mr. Drew Hard was in stable condition, an appropriate and life-saving intervention should then have been administered. Now that's the only line in the report that we need to focus on. Would you agree? I would agree that that's the line in the report, and, and as I've stated, those that was addressed again more in depth in his deposition. But I yeah, think that's the only thing. Yeah, I don't care about the deposition thing. right now. I just want to look at the report. As far as the report goes, that's the sentence that we have to focus on. Correct. Okay, tell me why that doesn't connect the dots. He says that life-saving measures should have then been initiated. Should have been administered. Should have been administered. Thank you. Um, and if I could explain it by way of an analogy, Your Honor, that's the same thing as saying um, if someone is having a heart attack, a doctor or, or frankly probably any layperson could say, well, CPR should be administered. That's a life-saving um, intervention that should be administered or the ACLS protocol. Those things should be administered. That is not the same thing as saying if those things were administered, would it save that patient? Would it make a difference to that patient? And that's what causation testimony is. It's does it make a difference in this specific case, this patient, would it have changed his outcome? Anybody can say things should or shouldn't have been done. That's kind of an extrapolation of what would happen if the standard of care was followed, but that's not saying that it would have made a difference for Mr. Drewer. <coughs> should have been done doesn't equal would have made a difference in his outcome. So you're reading life-saving intervention as just being a category of types of intervention, not saying that he's indicating that they that an intervention could have been made that would have been life-saving and therefore save the patient. Right, and I know you just want to focus on the report, but that was explored further in the deposition. No, when I understand. He was asked. I'm just trying to, you know, just trying to parse right. our focus as we move on then to the deposition. But, okay. Correct. So, counsel, if I'm understanding, in a case against a radiologist where the allegation is that he or she failed to recognize an emergent condition and adequately sound the alarm. In order for a plaintiff to ever demonstrate causation, that plaintiff is going to need not only expert testimony from a radiologist that the radiologist missed something that should have been seen, but testimony from a further medical professional that whatever intervention would have occurred had it been seen would have had an effect on the outcome. Yes, sir. So that's what's wrong here. If you were handling this case for the plaintiff, you would have had a, an additional expert yes. about what those interventions would be and how they would have been effective to save the patient's life. Yes. Okay. And I think Dr. Okay. Flick could have done it. I mean, even as a radiologist, uh, we all know that according to the case law, he was qualified as a medical professional. He could have said those things. But, but he, he said not. he wasn't qualified because he wasn't a surgeon. Right. Isn't the he upshot? took himself out, yes, and said he didn't know what what would be done. Um, and obviously, if he doesn't know what would have been done, he can't say whether any of those things would have made a difference in this case. Beyond failing in expert testimony to establish the four elements that are necessary to survive a summary judgment action, um, as was touched on earlier in, in plaintiff's argument, there's no cause in fact. Um, even if you disregard all of the, the problems with the lack of expert testimony in establishing the elements of the medical malpractice action, we get to the cause in fact. And as your honors um, already noted, no one really relied on this other than uh, Stan Wedman, who was the physician assistant taking care of Mr. Drurid at Harvard. Um, Dr. Rosenquist did the read, made a phone call because it was a stat exam, and told Stan Wedman three things about the gallbladder. He said, I think it is distended. It's about twice the size um, that it usually should be in a man of, of his age and characteristics, has gallstones, and has inflammation in the fat. So Stan Wedman and, and Dr. Rosenquist uh, knew that would trigger a transfer. It was his testimony that anytime there's a positive finding on a film, when it's in Harper, Kansas, they ship people out. They send them to where there's a higher level of care. And that's what happened. He called out 
what was a potentially emergent situation. Um, Dr. Beamer did testify in the case that that life-saving, uh, that gallbladder can be a life-threatening situation, whether that needs to come out. So this was an urgent read. It, it did prompt immediate action. He was immediately transported to Wichita, and then that was it. Nobody talked to Dr. Rosenquist afterwards. No one went back and looked at his read because it was not available. Um, it, things happened so quickly that the transcription wasn't done, so the report never made it past Harper, Kansas. Perhaps it did later, but not until after um, Mr. Drew had passed away. Nobody went back and spoke to Dr. Rosenquist. What Dr. Rosenquist read did was prompt an immediate transfer and prompt a surgical consult. And then from then on, four different physicians read that film. Dr. Jones, who was the resident on duty for Dr. Beamer, took that film down to a radiologist um, at Via Christi, read it with that radiologist. The two of them looked at it together. They didn't see anything urgent. Later, Dr. Beamer came. He looked at the film. He took it to the radiology department and looked at it with another radiologist. And I believe there were also two other residents that went down with them at that time. So potentially there were six other people that looked at that film and that's what they based their treatment decisions on. They looked at the film numerous times, they did numerous other studies, and they decided how to treat that patient based not on what Dr. Rosenquist had said, but based on those subsequent reads. And I think, uh, Justice Luker, you hit right on it. Dr. Beamer was not going to open this gentleman up based on a secondhand telephone call on what a, a first radiologist So, so does a, a, a subsequent read just relieve Dr. Rosenquist of any responsibility in this once it's out of his hands and someone else, based on, on uh, their opinion of what he's done, relieves uh, I think in this, him? in this unique circumstance it does, Your Honor. It would not, of course, if his read had been written down or had been the one that they based treatment off of. I think that's a different situation. Um, if the radiologist gives a read, obviously, and, and the surgeon looks at it, looks at the report, and says, okay, this is what I see, this is how I'm going to treat, that doesn't absolve him. But in this specific case, um, which is probably somewhat unique, right. but in this case, yes. Any further presentation? I think I will not take my full time unless the court has any other questions. Um, I think we've covered all the bases, but for those two reasons, uh, summary judgment is appropriate and plaintiff has failed to establish their burden as a matter of law and we would ask that the Court of Appeals decision be affirmed. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Reserve five minutes for a um, First of all, I'd like to address this matter of how Dr. Glick couches his testimony. I don't think that's for him to do. That's for the court to do. And he, he elsewhere, I would like to point out, that said, I can give causation opinions. That's on, in my brief on page six. So on the one hand, he says he can't give causation opinions. On the other hand, he says he can. And it, he did in his report. In his report, he says, this would have resulted in a stat this would have resulted in a stat ultrasound and or HIDA scan when Mr. Durd was in stable condition and appropriate life-saving intervention should then have been administered. Life-saving intervention, according to standard care, should then have been administered. He's a medical doctor. If you read, if you take his report and you take all the testimony that he gave and you put it together, it's all there. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm around, I see these things, I know what happens. And yeah, here, at one point, didn't he even say he wouldn't have even done any more studies? Right. He even he suggests that you know it wasn't even necessary to do anything else. That surgery should have been done promptly. And again, on page page uh, six of my brief, I quote some more of his testimony. He says that the information that was contained on the CAT scan should have precipitated some degree of urgency. Even after the transfer, they, should, they were still doing testing. And there was information that would probably, more likely than not, prompted much more aggressive action. And I 
the much more aggressive action is what he was talking about before when he was talking about life-saving intervention. And counsel, along those lines, what um, he does say at one point, I'm not a surgeon, but I, as I recall, he then immediately says, but I am a physician and I can put two and two together or right. words to that effect. Correct. What's your interpretation of what, what was Dr. Glick saying? What, what, what was he putting together when he says he can put two and two together? He, he's saying that I'm a radiologist <clears throat> And I know what the treatment is for um, a uh, gallbladder that has that's bleeding. You know that I, I'm a medical doctor. I, I work with these surgeons. We talk all the time about you know these films, <laughs> and I think that's what he was. He, he's saying he I have the knowledge. I have the knowledge not only because I'm a medical doctor. I went to medical school. I have the knowledge because I work right. in the hospital. One of the things he's putting together is the autopsy report. He says, I, I, I look at the scan, I look at the autopsy report, I can put two and two together. And that's exactly what he says. He says, I can put two and two together. It can, okay. And so your argument would be that what he's testifying to is he, he says, I can, I can put on the one hand, I can put this failure by Dr. Rosenquist to properly read the scan together with the autopsy report. And, and I... I testifying as a physician that I can put two and two together and those two things are related. Correct. Unless the court has other questions, I have no further argument. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thanks. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under <coughs> advisement.